motel clerk disappears, leaving behind a trail of blood. Investigators have their suspect, but without a victim, what can they charge him with? A shooting is reported, but investigators have no proof that it really occurred. Until they can sift fact from fiction, they haven't got a case. Is a missing sofa the key to a woman's disappearance? The prosecution can't rest until it can make sense of a series of odd clues. Murder is usually the most obvious of crimes. The victim's bodies mute witnesses to violence. But their silent testimony may go unheard when they disappear without a trace. Memphis, Tennessee, a thriving southern city. Home of Beale Street, the Blues, and Elvis Presley. But in 1997, it played host to a deadly mystery. In the early morning hours of February 8th, a man arrived at a Memphis motel. He became concerned when calls to the front desk went unanswered. He went to check it out. Hello? The clerk Hello? appeared to be missing. Hello? He didn't see anyone in the lobby, but there was blood on the counter. The office security door was open, and Hello? he noticed more blood on the frame. Convinced something was wrong, he left and called police. When Memphis police arrived, they discovered blood outside the motel entrance. Smearing indicated something had been dragged across the pavement. They found more clues inside. While the office showed no sign of forced entry, the cash register was open and empty. But a purse lying undisturbed nearby caught their attention. They didn't believe a woman would willingly leave it behind. The wallet inside still contained money, as well as a checkbook, credit cards, and driver's license in the name of Ricky Ellsworth. Alerted by police, the motel manager arrived and confirmed that Ricky Ellsworth was the clerk on duty. She said Ricky lived nearby with her husband, Don, and two children. A trusted, reliable employee, she wasn't the sort to just leave in the middle of her shift. Circumstances of the crime suggested more than robbery. Police suspected the clerk had been abducted. As police processed the scene, other significant details began to emerge. The office security door was equipped with a keypad, but it was open and showed no sign of tampering. Either someone had known the code or the clerk had unlocked the door. To investigators, that suggested Ricky Ellsworth might have known her abductor. Although police had begun to suspect foul play, Nothing prepared them for what they found in an adjacent bathroom. There were signs of a desperate struggle and much more blood. The running sink contained a small flashlight and the toilet seat had been ripped from its hinges. Wet, blood-tinged sheets indicated someone had tried to clean the room. Not only had Ricky Ellsworth disappeared, but it now seemed she'd been seriously injured. Captain R.G. Moore, who led the crime scene unit, feared the worst. 
When we don't have a body and we don't know exactly what happened, we'd handle it just like it's going to be a homicide case. If we process the scene, we collect our blood sample, we collect all the evidence we can find from the scene, and just keep it until we see what we've got. Investigators hoped the evidence would lead them to Ricky. A squad car brought the victim's husband, Don Ellsworth, to the motel. He said he and Ricky were happily married. He told police his wife was a kind person who worked with a Christian prison ministry in her spare time. Every Christmas, she baked pies for the prisoners. But Ellsworth said their marriage hadn't always been so tranquil. They'd once separated for two years, and she'd gotten involved with a man who assaulted her and went to prison for it. Ellsworth said the man's name was Michael Rimmer. After finishing at the scene, the investigators returned to the station to conduct a background check on Michael Rimmer. What they found in the files was chilling. Rimmer was a high school dropout with a history of drug problems and violence. In 1989, he was convicted of robbing and brutally assaulting Ricky Ellsworth. Details of Rimmer's previous assault on Ricky raised Detective Robert Shemwell's suspicions. His actions at that crime basically uh, mirrored what was happening here at the motel uh, with the cleaning up, our attempt to clean up the evidence. Um, we immediately began looking for Michael Rimmer. Meanwhile, detectives narrowed the time frame for Ricky's disappearance. They found a couple who had checked in with her at 1.15 a.m. But when two others tried to check out around 2.30, she wasn't there. Detectives located a witness who said he pulled into the motel at approximately 2.15, hoping to rent a room. But he saw a man with bloody knuckles behind the counter and left without registering. He also noticed a four-door maroon car backed up to the curb, its trunk and doors open. Based on his description, police put together a composite of the man at the motel. Using an identikit, a collection of facial parts and features that can be assembled as needed, the suspect's face came together. It resembled Michael Rimmer. Detectives then asked the witness to look through an album of more than 50 mugshots, including Rimmer's. Their hopes were dashed when he couldn't positively identify Rimmer as the man with the bloody knuckles. Detectives learned from a co-worker that Ricky had recently gotten a birthday card from a Michael in Mississippi. She took the card into the back office to read, but became angry and threw it away. It was becoming clear to detectives that if they wanted to find Ricky Ellsworth, they needed to find Michael Rimmer. They started at the auto repair shop where he worked. Nobody had seen him since Friday, the day before Ricky disappeared. He left his tools and paycheck behind. One more critical fact emerged. When we got to talking to the employees there, uh, this same maroon four-door vehicle was described as being Michael Rimmer's car. Um, so then we decided we need to track down and find out where Michael Rimmer got this four-door maroon vehicle. It wasn't registered to Rimmer. If it wasn't his, detectives wondered where he'd gotten it. His co-workers sent detectives to another friend of Rimmer's who told them that his own maroon four-door car had been stolen a month earlier, shortly after he'd last seen Rimmer. After four days, Ricky Ellsworth was still missing, and so was Michael Rimmer. Hoping for a clue to his whereabouts, police questioned his brother. Richard Rimmer said he'd last seen Michael on the morning of February 9th, just hours after Ricky Ellsworth disappeared. Michael had seemed exhausted when he arrived in the maroon car around 9.30 a.m. 
He asked Richard if he knew how to remove a blood stain from the back seat. Then, Michael pulled a muddy shovel from the car and scraped mud from his boots. Richard also told police that Michael claimed Ricky bought the car for him. She had visited Rimmer in prison after he claimed he'd found God. And Richard knew the two had met after his release. But somewhere along the line, the friendship soured. By now, two weeks had passed, and still nobody had seen or heard from Ricky Ellsworth. Detectives had lost hope of finding her alive, and their prime suspect, Michael Rimmer, still eluded them. They would have to find him and the stolen car if they had any chance of proving murder. I issued a theft of property warrant um, on Michael Rimmer and indicated in that warrant that when he, had, he was located, or if that vehicle was located, that it was to be uh, held for the Memphis Homicide Unit and processed. Detectives got a promising lead from one of Rimmer's former cellmates. He said Rimmer spoke of killing Ricky and burying her in Mississippi after he got out of prison. Rimmer's former girlfriend told detectives of a wooded area called Plantation Point near Arca Butler Lake in Mississippi. It was 45 minutes from Memphis. She said Rimmer liked to go there. Detectives headed to Plantation Point. They combed the area on foot, but didn't find anything. Then they called in Blackwater divers from the Shelby County Search and Rescue Unit. Specially trained to operate by touch in dark, murky black water, the divers searched the lake. They didn't find anything either. Detectives were thoroughly frustrated. They chased down every witness and lead, but were no closer to solving the case or finding Ricky Ellsworth or Michael Rimmer. Now, they'd run out of options. In Memphis, nearly a month had passed with no progress in the potential homicide case. In early March, detectives got a phone call from Johnson County, Indiana. A sheriff's deputy there had stopped a maroon car for speeding. When he ran a check on the license plate, he discovered the car was stolen and there was a warrant for the driver. Michael Rimmer, sought for crimes including robbery and possible murder, had been arrested during a routine traffic stop. Detectives flew to Indiana, prepared to finally question Rimmer and examine the car for evidence. After obtaining a warrant, forensic investigators with the Johnson County Crime Unit searched the car. They hoped for solid evidence, but never expected to find what they did. Numerous receipts, uh, hotel receipts, pawn shop receipts, uh, restaurant receipts, um, showing Mike's every step from the day Ricky came up missing to his actual apprehension. Investigators tested the stained back seat for human blood. Results were positive. It was their first physical evidence to suggest a connection between Rimmer and the crime. Memphis detectives questioned Michael Rimmer over the next two days. He denied stealing the car or having anything to do with Ricky's disappearance. So far, all their evidence was circumstantial. Without Ricky's body, there was only one way to link Rimmer to her murder. The blood from the rear of the vehicle Michael Rimmer was occupying and the blood from the scene matched. Um, we had a problem though, we had to determine or show somehow that that blood was Ricky Ellsworth's blood. They had one chance, a reverse paternity DNA test, which uses the combined DNA traits passed on from parents to determine the DNA characteristics of their children. Forensic scientists compared blood from Ricky's mother to samples from the crime scene and the maroon car. They matched. The test established a 16 million to one probability that blood from the car and motel came from an offspring of Ricky's mother. It was the final link police needed to prove murder. Michael Rimmer's guilt was written in blood. 
Based on evidence, police believe they know what happened on February 8th. Michael Rimmer drove to the motel sometime around 1.30 a.m., knowing Ricky Ellsworth would be alone. When he arrived, she let him into the office. There, Rimmer exploded into violence, attacking her, then wrapping her body in sheets. Afterward, he tried to clean the room, but gave up and left the sink running. Dragging Ricky to his car, Rimmer made his escape. Although her body was never found, police believe Ricky Ellsworth is buried somewhere near Arca Butler Lake. Michael Rimmer was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. While no body was ever found in the Rimmer case, police used blood evidence to prove murder. But in Cleveland, Ohio, police would have to build a case on even less. On Saturday, December 15, 1984, Cleveland police were called to the home of Ernestine Campbell. She reported that her brother, Henry, was missing, and she feared for his life because she'd heard he'd been shot and his body hidden in an alley. She told police she'd last seen Henry the night before when he'd left home for a nearby after-hour spot. Officers searched the alley but didn't find a body. In fact, they didn't find any signs of foul play. They drove through the neighborhood, but didn't see anything unusual. There was no sign of Henry Campbell, and nothing to indicate a violent crime had occurred. Officers canvassed the area, talking to residents who might have seen or heard something the night before. One witness claimed she heard shots and saw men running near the club. Another recalled hearing shots, but couldn't provide any other details. Still others confirmed shots were fired, but nobody admitted seeing anything. Police were frustrated. They had reports of gunfire and a murder, but couldn't find the purported victim. Homicide detective John Quayley, the lead investigator, recalls the odd circumstances of the case. Well, usually we're called to the scene of a homicide where we have a victim laying on the street or in a house, but we have a victim. Uh, and a lot of times we'll be able to get the weapon used in uh, a crime. With this incident, we were, a murder was reported. We went to the scene. We didn't have a body. We couldn't find the body. We couldn't find any evidence of blood, or we didn't have a weapon. It was kind of starting without anything to work with. Police needed more information, so they returned to the Campbell house. Ernestine gave them a picture of Henry and more details. She'd heard that some people claimed they'd seen Clarence Barnes shoot her brother in the back. She said Barnes ran the after-hours club in his home and that there was bad blood between him and Henry. Hi, Miss Richardson, sorry. At the station, people who had been at the club that night began coming forward. A woman named Jacqueline Richardson told investigators she saw Campbell at the club and that he argued with Barnes. When Campbell left, Barnes, who had a gun, followed him outside. She said the two men were joined by a third and walked out of her sight. Shortly after that, a woman ran into the club screaming that there'd been a shooting and Henry Campbell was injured. 
the other first two. Or was Richardson went outside, where a passerby told her some men were chasing and shooting at another. She said she didn't see anything and returned to the club. Barnes was already there, asking everyone to leave. As the search continued for evidence of murder, Victor Santiago told police what he knew. He was the third man Jacqueline Richardson had described, and his account took up where hers left off. He said he'd seen the two men arguing outside the club and heard Barnes order Campbell to leave. According to Santiago, Campbell caught up with him a few moments later. As they walked down the street, he heard a shot and Campbell fell forward. Santiago said he took cover, then watched Barnes fire three more shots at the prostrate Campbell. Police now had two eyewitness accounts, but still no evidence of a homicide. Henry Campbell had disappeared, and detectives had two eyewitness accounts of murder, but no body and no evidence. Several residents claimed Clarence Barnes bragged that he'd burned Campbell's body and that nobody would ever find him. Investigators brought Barnes to the station for questioning. He admitted having words with Campbell and asking him to leave, but said he didn't know what happened after that. He denied having anything to do with Campbell's disappearance. When police asked Barnes what he did for a living, he told them he worked at the Animal Resource Center at a local university. That immediately rang a bell in Qualey's mind, and he called Barnes' supervisor. We asked him if he had a, uh, an incinerator in the, the school. And he said, oh, yes. And he, we asked him how big it was. He said it was big enough to incinerate a steer. We told him then that we uh, were investigating a ho homicide and that possibly there may be human remains in the incinerator and asked him if he would seal the room. He did. The next morning, detectives and a team of forensic investigators went to the Animal Resource Center, believing they might find the remains of Henry Campbell. While the facility director arranged access to the incinerator, the security chief showed them surveillance video from the night Campbell disappeared. It showed Barnes arriving around 3.30 a.m. He backed into the receiving area, which was approximately 15 feet from the incinerator entrance. Police could see him carrying something toward the incinerator room, but couldn't identify what it was. The picture then jumped away and came back, and in the next picture was the incinerator door open and Clarence pushing a cart in there. You could not see what was on the cart, but we knew he was in the incinerator room at that hour. When investigators saw the incinerator, they knew they were in for a long, complicated task. Dr. Elizabeth Balraj, coroner of Cuyahoga County, recalls the challenge. And there were 100 gallons of cremated ashes or containing um, uh, the remains from various animals. And we had to sift through those and find a very small amount of human bones. If human bones were to be found at all, the team began the painstaking process of sifting through the incinerator contents. Using a fine mesh screen, they collected fragments of bone and other unburned debris. Though most of the fragments were tiny and charred, some appeared to be human, including a vertebra, mandible, and part of a pelvis. They also found a piece of melted lead. Its size and mass were consistent with a 38 caliber bullet. It was the first solid evidence of murder. Although investigators believed they'd found Henry Campbell, their case would go up in smoke if they couldn't prove it. They turned to Dr. C. Owen Lovejoy, a biological anthropologist at Kent State University and an expert at identifying altered or damaged remains. 
he applied his skills to making a positive identification from the incomplete and severely damaged bone fragments. Lovejoy concurred with Dr. Balraj that approximately 160 of the recovered bones were human. The next step was determining whether they came from one person and whether that person was Henry Campbell. The process would be complicated by their condition. Here the pieces of the puzzle, all of the edges had been frayed, as you will, by the cremation process. And so none of the pieces fit together and we had to look at them in an isolated state. After a thorough inventory of the fragments, Lovejoy determined that portions of an entire skeleton were present. No bones were duplicated. That told Lovejoy the remains came from a single individual. But was it Henry Campbell? Next, he would try to establish specifics about the individual. Investigators had recovered part of the pelvis, which is diagnostic for both sex and age. Lovejoy concluded the remains belonged to a male, approximately Henry Campbell's age. While detectives were closer to proving they'd found Campbell, they needed positive identification. But Lovejoy couldn't give them that, not without more to go on. Whenever we have a candidate individual that we believe the skeletal remains might match, what we do is we try to get a pre-mortem x-ray Investigators delivered existing x-rays of Henry Campbell to Dr. Lovejoy. Could they help him prove murder? As Cleveland detectives sought to identify the bones found in the incinerator, Dr. Owen Lovejoy compared post-mortem x-rays and bone fragments with Campbell's radiographs. He focused on the skull, hand, and mandible. One recovered cranial fragment had a BB embedded in it. That matched an x-ray taken when Henry Campbell had accidentally been shot years earlier. Lovejoy also identified shared characteristics between Campbell's other x-rays and corresponding bone fragments. But he found the most compelling correlations in the lower mandible, or jawbone. And the outline of that jaw, the details of the bone structure, and the details of the root areas where the, where the teeth had been prior to death, all uh, were configured in such a way that they indicated that this was a positive identification. Since the jaw figured so prominently in that identification, Dr. Elizabeth Robinson, the team's forensic odontologist, reviewed Lovejoy's conclusions. In her opinion, two significant findings bolstered his analysis. The end of the jawbone was flat, a unique defect present in Henry Campbell's jaw. A second anomaly, an area of intense calcification, clinched the identification. And it was in exactly the same area that it was on the postmortem as on the antemortem. It was also only five millimeters in size. In other words, it's the exact same size, same area, and on both x-rays. With the positive identification, investigators had literally pulled proof of a homicide from the ashes. On December 21st, Less than one week after Henry Campbell was reported missing, Barnes was officially charged with murder. Based on the evidence, police believe Barnes followed Campbell from his after-hours club, shot him, then hid his body. Later that night, Barnes took Campbell's body to the Animal Resource Center, where he incinerated it. In April of 1985, Clarence Barnes pled guilty to the murder of Henry Campbell. He received 15 years to life for aggravated murder. In Cleveland, police had to sift their case from a pile of ashes. In Maryland, investigators followed a winding trail of clues to capture a killer. Rockville, Maryland, August 10th, 1988. 17-year-old Kai Lau returned early from a California vacation at the behest of a family friend to check on his mother, Lisa Tu. He hadn't heard from her in nearly a month, and others told him they hadn't heard from her either. That wasn't like his mother. When he and his mother's friend found no sign of Lisa in the house, they contacted police.
they went to the Special Investigations Office at the Montgomery County Police Department to report her missing. Uh, Detective Turner? Yes. Kai informed officers that nobody had seen or heard from his mother for a month. Yes, the reason I called is... He said that his stepfather, Gregory II, might know more, but he was overseas on business and Kai didn't know how to reach him. Before Gregory left, he told friends that Lisa had flown to San Francisco to visit a friend in the hospital. Kai said it was unusual for his mother to go away without telling anyone except Gregory. Police promised to investigate. Anything looks suspicious up there? Yes. They began by contacting the airlines. Records confirmed that a one way ticket had been purchased for LL2 on July 13th. The destination was San Francisco via a connecting flight in Los Angeles. The ticket to Los Angeles had been used, but not the one for San Francisco. It appeared Lisa, too, wasn't planning to come back. This is the one the that was her right, the but the detectives that. needed to make one more call. They contacted the friend Lisa was supposed to be visiting in San Francisco. She said she hadn't been in the hospital, wasn't expecting Lisa, and hadn't yeah. talked to her in months. Now, detectives began to consider whether Lisa, too, intended to disappear, or if there might be a more sinister explanation. Detective Roger Thompson worked the case. It was not the normal missing person case where we, we know somebody's missing for a particular reason. They may not contact family members, but we sooner or later find them. This had some, um, some mystery to it. To find out more, detectives spoke to several of Lisa's friends and learned the twos had been married nearly 10 years. It was the second marriage for both, and Kai Lau was Lisa's son from her previous marriage. The twos had enjoyed the good life. Gregory was a successful restaurateur. In fact, one of his restaurants had been a favorite of Washington's elite. But it hadn't lasted. He'd suffered business reversals and lost his restaurants. A commissioned sales job couldn't support the family's affluent lifestyle. Gregory and Lisa argued about money, and their marriage was rocky. Police also learned that Lisa was romantically involved with another man. Police questioned him at his office. He said he spoke to Lisa the afternoon of July 14th, the last day anyone saw or heard from her. He denied knowing anything about a trip to San Francisco and expressed concern over Lisa's sudden disappearance. He indicated Lisa's husband was suspicious about their relationship. When he passed a polygraph test, investigators believed he was telling the truth. Detectives checked out the family's finances and saw indications of serious problems. Gregory was $30,000 in debt. Detective Mike Turner realized two was under a lot of pressure. Gregory was uh, known to like to gamble. And we determined that he, through interviews with friends, had accrued some debt in gambling that he had not been able to pay. And this was another problem that uh, arose uh, with his relationship with Lisa. Detectives also learned Lisa Tu's bank and charge accounts had been inactive since early July. That didn't make sense if she was alive. They discovered that her husband, who was still unreachable on a business trip, would collect a $200,000 life insurance policy if anything happened to his wife. Detectives began to suspect that the couple's financial woes might spell more than a simple missing persons case. As the investigation continued, Lisa's son was doing a little detective work of his own. Kai Lau found his mother's address book in her bedroom. That was odd because she seldom went anywhere without it. He also noticed that furniture in the house was missing or rearranged. 
he called Detective Turner. Hi, Detective Turner. Kai returned to the police station and met with investigators. He had found that $44,000 had been withdrawn from a bank account Lisa kept for his education. And that wasn't all. Kai told police his stepfather's gun was missing and a sleep sofa had disappeared. He said his mother often slept on it when she and Gregory weren't getting along. Kai also informed detectives that his stepfather, Gregory, was due back from his business trip that evening. By now, investigators had a lot of questions for Gregory, too. They met him at the airport and brought him to the police station. He was concerned about his wife and was eager to help police. He told them he bought Lisa a plane ticket to San Francisco so she could visit a friend in the hospital. He said he drove her to Dulles International Airport the next day and watched her board the plane. You wouldn't lie to us, would you, Mr. Two? Absolutely not. He claimed she called from Los Angeles and said she was awaiting the flight to San Francisco. He hadn't heard from her since. When they told him Lisa's friend wasn't sick and wasn't expecting her, he seemed surprised. Then he offered another explanation. He claimed his wife was unhappy with her appearance and wanted plastic surgery. He said they'd argued about it in the past. He surmised that might have been the real reason for the trip. Lisa probably made up the story of a sick friend, realizing he wouldn't buy the ticket if he'd known the truth. When detectives inquired about the missing sofa, Two said it was infested with mice, and he had it hauled away. He also said he threw the gun away after a well-publicized local incident where a homeowner shot some trespassers. He explained away the $30,000 debt as business and travel expenses. Two begged off further questions, saying he was tired from his long trip. Detectives agreed to continue the interview another day if two would take a polygraph test. He agreed and promised to return the following Monday. Gregory, too, didn't keep his appointment. He skipped town. To detectives, that seemed the act of a guilty man. We then felt that the suspicions that the family had that we had put together uh, since the initiation of the investigation now had come to fruition and we were looking probably at a homicide. Their suspicions about Gregory II grew even more when Kai brought them an Air Express letter from California. In it, Gregory claimed he was in Los Angeles looking for Lisa. If he didn't find her there, he planned to continue his search in San Francisco. Investigators considered the letter a self-serving excuse from a guilty man. But believing and proving are two different things. Without Lisa's body, there was no evidence she was dead. They began looking for proof in Gregory's story. Investigators followed up on Kai's tip about his missing college money and enlisted the help of the state's attorney's office. John McCarthy, deputy state attorney in Montgomery County, found Lisa had controlled it. Gregory too cleaned out that account. We got bank photographs from the bank and you, clear as day you could see Gregory too stealing the $44,000 from that fund. And within a period of 10 days after he stole it, he had run through that money. It was gone. Detective Turner re-examined the airline ticket to San Francisco. They learned it was possible for someone to check in, have the ticket marked, but not board the plane. He suspected Gregory too had done that and that Lisa never boarded the plane. They contacted passengers who'd been on the flight. Then, attorney McCarthy got a real break. A woman called to say she'd been on the plane with her husband and small child. While airborne, the couple took several photographs. She says, well, I've got some pictures 
of the seat that Lisa too was supposed to be in on that plane from uh, Washington to uh, San Francisco and uh, she's not in those pictures and she forwarded to me those pictures and uh, one of the ways we were able to prove conclusively that Lisa was not on that plane that Gregory said she was on was with the, those pictures. Detectives wanted to know more about the missing sofa sleeper. They wondered if Lisa's body was inside it when it was hauled away. They tracked down the men who picked it up. They remembered the couch because Gregory tipped them for carrying it out to the truck. They didn't notice anything unusual about it. Investigators traced it to the landfill, but that was a dead end. The sofa had already been ground up and buried. Detectives reasoned that Gregory might have gotten rid of the sofa because it contained proof of Lisa's death. If that were true, there could be other evidence at the residence. They obtained a search warrant to find out. An examination of Gregory's car uncovered incriminating evidence. Clumps of mud, weeds, and twigs were stuck in the undercarriage, indicating the car had been driven off-road. In the trunk, they found a plastic tarp, a carving knife, and a machete. Mike, come over here. Look. All of the items were clean, but they could have been used to dispose of a body. Inside the house, detectives found their first physical evidence of foul play. There were droplets of blood on a chair near the spot where the sofa had stood. But investigators suspected more might have been cleaned up. To find out, they processed the area with a luma light, which makes blood that cannot be seen with the naked eye glow. They discovered blood spatters where the sofa had been, and it displayed a significant pattern. We know that the couch was open at the time when this all occurred because there was no blood swiping or markings underneath the couch. It was a fold away, opened up couch, and when they put out the processing, you could see, basically see, the outline of the couch opened up as a bed. Investigators also found signs of smearing, evidence someone had tried to clean up the blood. While they were processing the scene, the phone rang. A car rental agency in Las Vegas was calling for Gregory II. Yes. The car he rented several days before was overdue. Okay. It was the break police were looking okay. for. Now they finally knew where two was, but they needed some help in capturing him. What I would like you to do is, if he calls in about the car in the next few days, or brings the car in, try to stall him, or if he calls in, tell him that you would like to replace the car with another car because this one needs reservice or whatever reason you can think of or it's going to be resold but somehow get him to come to the rental office to get another car. Hello, my name's Greg. The plan worked. On Saturday, September 10th, he arrived at the car rental office. Yes, your car is ready. It is? Police arrested him on a fugitive warrant nearly a month after he disappeared. Detectives Turner and Thompson flew to Las Vegas, where they began retracing Two's activities since he fled Maryland. A matchbook in his hotel room led them to a Chinese restaurant. The manager recognized Two from a photograph. She told investigators he had applied for a job, saying his wife was dead and he wanted to start a new life. On the job application, he gave his name as Greg Sen. When the detectives returned home with two, they called in a document examiner at the Maryland State Police Crime Lab. They knew Gregory had used aliases, 
They wanted to confirm whether the handwriting on the job application and other items he wrote matched the bank slip closing Kai Lau's college account. The stolen money would provide the motive for the more serious crime of suspected homicide. After providing known samples of Tu's writing, detectives awaited the results of the document examination. The job application, bank slip, and other documents were compared against Tu's handwriting. In making the comparison, factors such as writing style, speed, and pressure are all studied. Document examiner David Sexton explains. And it's a combination of those characteristics as well as uh, a combination of recognizable letter formations and that combination of characteristics that are uh, unique to, to the individual's handwriting. The writing on the job application, bank slip, and other documents was Gregory Tews. Hi, how are you? Police also consulted a forensic serology investigator about the blood spatters found at the two house. He confirmed they were consistent with a high velocity wound, most likely from a gunshot. Despite all the evidence investigators had collected, their case was still flawed. They needed something solid to prove murder. Without Lisa's body, the only physical evidence they had was blood from the house. In a divorce settlement. They had to somehow tie it to the victim. Kathy, Karen, and Linda, and they, all, they, all they had only them. one chance, and it was a long shot. To prove Lisa, too, had been murdered, Maryland investigators had to link her to the blood in the house. They hoped forensic DNA analysis could do that, but in 1988, it was still in its infancy. In fact, DNA evidence had only been used in a few trials nationally, none of them murder cases. And the two case posed a significant challenge. There were no known samples of Lisa Tu's DNA that could be used for comparison. Without them, it would be difficult to connect Lisa with the blood spatter. The DNA lab needed to perform a reverse paternity test, but this time they would have to work backward. They would determine Lisa's DNA from the blood of her son. Because Kai Lau was a genetic combination of both his parents, scientists could, in theory, forensically subtract his father's DNA from his blood. What remained would be Lisa's DNA profile. Blood was drawn from Kai Lao and from his father in Hong Kong for comparison. By process of elimination, the lab confirmed with 98 to 99 percent accuracy that blood found at the two house was Lisa's. With forensic DNA testing, detectives were able to prove homicide. Investigators believe Gregory too was moved to murder by jealousy over his wife's affair and the prospect of solving his financial problems with her life insurance. They pieced together a likely scenario for the night of July 14th. There were indications that the couple had argued, perhaps over the affair, perhaps about money. Desperate and enraged, Gregory too pulled his gun from the cabinet and shot Lisa. He then disposed of her body. Despite his protestations of innocence, Gregory too was convicted of first degree murder on November 21st, 1989. He is currently serving a life sentence. Lisa Tu's body has never been found. Once, police had no chance of proving murder without a body. But today, they can make a case on forensic science even when the victim has disappeared without a trace.